You're not here to hear me. Uh, my name's Adam Jasper. I know some of you from teaching scenarios, but I'm here to do a very brief introduction for Michael Stevenson, who's our guest presenter for this lecture. Um, it's a ritual of, of these lectures that someone in my position gives a kind of biographical sketch and positions someone's work, and then by the end of it, you're then so bored that you don't want to listen to the presenter themselves. I'll cut this down a little and just tell you two quick facts, um, or two quick moments. One was uh, in about 2010, was that the year of the, no, 29 was the year of the MCA show. 10, 2010. 2010. Uh, was a year of a, a major show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. It was the first time that I encountered uh, Michael Stevenson's work. So now about yeah, 12, 13 years ago. And uh, I remember uh, an experience of uh, something like befuddlement or amazement when I went through the series of rooms with these sometimes found, sometimes fabricated historical artifacts and felt myself moving deeper and deeper into a kind of paranoid critical cosmos in which correlations that had seemed like they were chance suddenly seemed to have a fatal and deeper inner meaning. I felt like I was entering into the belly of some kind of secret at the time. It was a sort of experience that I dreamed of in museums and very rarely had. And it culminated in a kind of basement space, confronting it something halfway between a labyrinth or a rat trap and a giant robot. It was glowing on a shrine. And that I learned from the room notes was a, a sort of hydraulic calculator that modeled the world economy, or the British economy. Uh, the experience of finding a model of the world economy at the center of a contemporary art exhibition was, was at the time of a, a a new one for me. That's one moment, and I'm not going to go any deeper into it to set it up. The other moment was uh, a show that I then learned about subsequently, which I never saw. Um, because as a result of seeing that first show, I, I wrote an essay on Michael's work, which is how he actually came to meet. This is also a tip. If you find something interesting and you write about it, you often get to meet the person who did it. Um, and that was a sh the second show was a show in 2003. It was the Venice Biennale, uh, the New Zealand Pavilion that uh, uh, Michael was the uh, representative artist for. And the work centered around the history of the only car to be mass produced in New Zealand, the Trekker, a vehicle that was a sort of crossbreed between a Skoda and a Land Rover. It was a sort of two-wheel drive, utility vehicle, incredibly robust, incredibly inefficient, incredibly crude, um, but it was the national pride of the country. And it looked a little bit like a, a drawing of a car made by someone who had the idea of making one but had never built one before. It had a kind of prosaic or prototypical look to, the, to it as a vehicle. And I, as I later found out from, uh, from reading the research that Michael put together for the exhibition, I think the production numbers were roughly one a day. They were made in a shearing shed, in a kind of emulation of the idea of Fordist mass production, but done on the scale of an archipelago that at the time was at the edge of the world economy. And they could only make things out of components but from Land Rover and Skoda because it was so much at the periphery that it almost wasn't even in the Cold War. And as I remember from the notes, they used to buy parts for the cars by, with suitcases of sausage skins, because there was a terrible shortage, I think, of sausage skins in Prague at the time. So this is if I remember the anecdote correctly. Now, these two fragmentary stories, one about the world economy in the basement of a museum, and the other one about a, a car that is a, a model of industrialization sitting in a pavilion in Venice in 2003. They're both products of, of research projects. And one of the reasons we get to invite Michael now is that he's not only an artist, but he's one of the people who crystallized the idea and the praxis of art as research, and research as potential art. So a lot of the work involves methods and techniques for pursuing questions from their surfaces 
to their unexpected prehistories and making out of this pursuit a story. How do you make a story out of a research agenda? Um, right. I'll leave it there and I'll let Michael take over. Thanks very much, Adam, for that introduction. Um, and thanks very much for inviting me here this evening to talk. Um, some of the very basic biographical information about myself you will have um, gained from from Adam's introduction, but I should I should just say that I'm I'm an artist like born in New Zealand. I studied in New Zealand. Um, I've been living the last twenty more years in Berlin, where I've been practicing as an artist and exhibiting widely ac across Europe, the U.S., and of course with a with a um, emphasis back into Australia and New Zealand again as well. So. Um, <clears throat> that's that's what I have been the the, the scope of my, um, where I've been exhibiting, if you like, and I've been teaching um, at an art academy, the RDBK in Nuremberg. Um, I teach a class in sculpture there. I wasn't there this week because I'm here doing this, but um, I have a full time professorship there teaching as well. I did a guest teaching in um, Geneva. Um, in these last years as well. But this evening, I, what I wanted to do was take you, like I'll give you sort of a walkthrough, take you through a, an exhibition I made recently, um, which is a large scale exhibition uh, that took place last year at Kunstwerke in Berlin, which is a major contemporary art venue in the middle of the, the city. Um, the title of the show was Disproof Does Not Equal Disbelief. Um, and it drew on a range of my output over a longer period of time, going back like before the time I was living in Germany, um, some 35 or more years. So, of course, it's very uneven in all sorts of ways because that's what happens when you move and shift geographically. So one of the big questions was, because it's just a specific number, quite a small number of things from very disparate parts of, of my practice, if you like. One of the big questions is, how do we nav navigate all this? How do we move through it as a viewer? How do we make an exhibition out of this? So each project is developed, as, as um, Adam was saying, through research-based methods. Um, so, I mean, you, I, I would describe my are not showing. No, they're not supposed to yet. Okay. You just look at me for a start and then I introduce. Okay. I have control of the images. Okay. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm delaying the... Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, research-based practice has kind of become industry standard, if you like, for contemporary art. I mean, Everybody stands up these days at a lecture and say, my practice is research-based. I guess years ago this used to mean something, but now that kind of everybody does it, it, it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Um, but still lots of questions remain in terms of, of this kind of methodology, and we wanted to like look at some of that today. Like um, how much of it like the research knowledge is needed for a viewer experience of the work because of course no one's ever going to understand all the all the detail of of the research right and how how should it the research knowledge be communicated like does that is that like embedded in the actual artwork somehow as like an artifact or something or a, or a placeholder for an artifact or is it um, external to the artwork or object somehow is it a wall text is it a leaflet is it is it an extended wall label or something um, these are obviously some of the most common ways that this is done but these these are whole huge questions that are kind of remain unresolved. 
So, um, so I, I should also say that like reading is not the same as viewing. Okay. So there are lots of questions that I was dealing with in and around the intelligibility of an artwork. And this became central for the exhibition and it would boil down to a, a simple question of like, how do we communicate? Okay, so here there is a view, like an informal view of a viewer in the exhibition um, to introdu introduce this kind of direct encounter with a work with something you've never seen before, which is in, in a sense like meeting an alien. So is this encounter, is it, is it only understood through this kind of interaction or, or, and how does other material, written lists or other things, how do they come into play and how, how as a viewer, how can you understand and put all this information together? And if there is other material available, I mean, does it exclude this kind of direct um, experience with an object or can they, can they work together? To work through some of this material, I um, looked in detail at um, this uh, book that's written by a woman, Lucy Suchman. I mean, maybe some of you have heard of her. This is from, from quite some time ago, 1985. She wrote a book called Plans and Situated Action, The Problem of Human-Machine Communication. So it's really like a foundation, if you like, for, for AI and machine learning. But Suchman was part of a group of um, people, a number of very prominent women who were involved in cybernetics. She worked at a very famous research institute at the time um, that was um, run by Rank Xerox um, called Xerox Park. I don't know if perhaps some of you have heard of that. This is in California. Um, Xerox was at the time um, a real contender for making hardware and software and producing like their own interface, if you like. Um, but they also employed lots of social scientists um, who did all their field work in, in this whole world of, of the copy industry and copy machines. I see, when I come here, I see lots of copy machines too. So this is kind of um, interesting. But what um, really struck me is this um, uh, preface to her book, which introduces two different forms of navigation. So one, you have this European form, which of course I think we're familiar with. It begins with a plan, a course, and, chart, and you chart according to universal principles. So you can take this and go anywhere you want. Yeah? And throughout the voyage, you have to remain on course. And if, if something unexpected happens, you first have to change your plan and then um, steer accordingly. In contrast to this, um, Micronesian navigation from the, the Pacific, um, a group of people called the Chukis, they begin not with a plan, but with an objective and they set off and respond to the conditions as they arrive in an ad hoc fashion. They use information from the wind, the waves, the tide, the current, the fauna, the stars, the clouds, and the sounds of the water on their boat and steer accordingly. They do whatever it takes to reach their ob objective. If asked, they can point to it, but they cannot describe their course. So, my ambition was then to um, place a series of these research-based artworks into the context of the Kunstwerker spaces where they could be navigated and situated as like situated material, right? Like colour, light, gesture, arrangement, and also an acknowledgement of the, the viewer's body moving through these spaces. Yeah? Um, so in this way, navigation itself builds a narrative, or if you like, mise-en-scene. Um, of course, there was also a leaflet, there was wall text, there was other material, as you see there's a floor plan. 
Um, and this could be used, of course, but we know, you know, from experience of, of going to exhibitions, we don't always pick the stuff up. We don't always read the material, but if we're in a space with an art object, with an artwork, we do, in a sense, always have this kind of two keys encounter-based experience. So what I want to do is kind of engage both of these um, navigational methods and take you through the exhibition. Um, the work itself engages with many different things. Um, I'll give you a very quick list before uh, we go through it. Like the evolution of mass media technology, the centrality of the marketplace in our everyday activities, especially in relationship to its volatility and its like cyclical behaviour. Um, I'm also very interested in education. I teach and um, that's also become something that's, that's become part of, of my work as well. And you'll find material also in relation to like faith-based um, belief and also in relation to th th this kind of belief in relation to technology. And um, the infrastructural systems that enable all these things. Okay, so here we step into it. Um, this is the, the, the entrance at the very front door. Um, so it's the very beginning and you walk into the back of something, the reverse rather than the front, if you like. And it's noisy, as you can see, because there's a, there's a fan right at your feet and um, you're confronted with this large, soft, um, inflatable which is tethered it has ropes tying it up to the ceiling um, and cables coming out of it as well and as you move around you then see this very large object object in the space um, and a very very low horizon line at kind of flood height if you like um, and a sequence and series of um, paper which is discolored by sun, by water, kind of damaged if you like, um, and serialized. Um, last in the space as you come around to the other side of this inflated space, um, you see an interior. Um, and it's, it's like entering a black box, or, or, if you like, or um, being swallowed by a whale and inside the space only for one body. And what you'll see on the left hand table is hard drives times six. You'll see behind the table screens times six, which are all playing um, computer games um, autonomously. And it's all networked together somehow and connected to the singular laptop. They re it rests on two tables, um, which are constructed in a slightly different kind of a way because I, I would describe this like as aftermarket assemblies. The, the other material is all that, that I've described, the hard drives, the screens, is all, of course, off the rack. But this, this other form of construction here has, is items that you can obviously directly purchased, but then they've been constructed together in this particular way to build a to build tables. But it's a, it's a different kind of production cycle, if you like. Here to go into a little bit of um, more in terms of these, this work, this is like work on paper, if you like, newspaper headline posters um, like uh, that are advertisements for the sa daily sale of newspapers at point of sale, so at newsstands. This is a work I made from 2000, 2002. And it follows a chronology, it's ordered by date, an anatomy, if you like, of financial crisis, um, which you'll probably be able to read in the headlines there, um, unfolding over some 18 months, beginning with the October 1987 share market crash, which was an enormous global event 
And, but this is all told from a New Zealand perspective, through New Zealand newspapers. And in New Zealand at the time, this was kind of like first contact with massive market correction. Um, synchronous, at exactly the same moment of, of, of crisis, um, There is the arrival into the country of the German painter Georg Immendorf as inaugural artist in a residency program for a new like international program. The press saw this as some kind of welcome distraction from the financial shitstorm that was going on. He was independently wealthy, flamboyant, um, spouted progressive politics and had a practice based in the geopolitics of the day, which is to say the division of Germany and the Cold War order. So what I'll do here is step very quickly through some of the research material I used. Um, this is a dummy publication. Do people know what a, a dummy is? Yep, it's... it's um, it's a single volume, single exa example of a publication that's going to be made to give some kind of, of material character of that publication. So how it feels in the hand, how it opens, what kind of binding it is, how heavy it is. But it has no content. It's just to describe it materially for the client. So often so it can be, you can have sign off for a contract. So here's the dummy awaiting Immendorf's arrival in the country. And it's, it's pre-digital, because it's from 1987, so it's kind of like a folk object. Um, but strangely, it's full of content. Okay, so we'll step through the first pages, and we come here to like what would be uh, Immendorf's biography page, where you would have a picture of the artist. I mean, there's a very, very standard kind of um, publication. So a picture of the artist and a brief description of where he's born, exhibitions he's made, etc. Ex ex et um, and it has this placeholder image, right, which is like very hard to understand what this is. And, and with further research, I discovered that this is actually Rolf Polar who was a member of the RAF, which, you know, the, the left-wing extreme political action group in Germany at the time, active in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, this is him being arrested in Athens in 1976 at a newsstand, buying a newspaper, buying the Süddeutsche Zeitung, through which he sent and received secret messages in the classified. So this is the folly image that was then be replaced by the artist's portrait. Okay? So there's this very strange relationship between this of like these these two characters here and here. And we step on and this this is the, the work he was commissioned to paint in New Zealand as a placeholder image. Okay, so this is not his work. This is somebody has invented this image because back in the day, you, there wasn't like these um, all these um, archives or, or these, this material that you could digitally that you could just insert an image. You had to make an image, right? So this this image, like um, also like like speaks to like a group of men drinking, in this case, I believe, Malibu rum, in very high colour tones, with a kind of uh, like a um, military theme going on, perhaps something of um, Inglorious Bastards, which eventually would be replaced by this group of men drinking, in high key colour as well. Um, but what I want to do is also then just very quickly take you back to life in New Zealand at the time. It looked sometimes like this, okay? What we have here in the middle is a photograph of the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, um, Robert Muldoon and his wife, Thea. 
surrounded by the cast of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. This is the local stage production um, in which the former Prime Minister was a participant, was the narrator, <laughs> known as Count Robula. Because it's a very, very strange thing. And if you, looks like there's some, not only celebration here, but tension, there is, because this very feral group of, of citizens are not people who would have voted for this man. Okay? But I'm bringing this up because there are several of these newspaper headline posters that talk about Count Robula and talk about Rocky Horror, okay? Um, his premiership was kind of a high watermark for isolationist, debt-ridden island economy, if you like, to put it in a few very simple words. It um, proceeded like a very, very rapid series of deregulation, public asset sell-offs, and then rolls into this moment that the headlines capture, which is like um, the 87 financial crisis share market crash. But Rocky Horror itself is a defining example of what's called breaking the fourth wall, which is a disruption between what happens on stage or on camera and <coughs> on screen and the viewer. Um, it, it breaks this like geographic and temporal <coughs> divorce that is traditionally set between the audience and um, the actor. And enables like this out of character direct communication between the two. I mean, people are familiar with some of this, of course. You'd see it in, on stage um, famously, and you like this is a stage production, but also filmed. And you see it in, in film as well. But I sort of see this um, concept of breaking the fourth wall as a, as a feature of the evolution of um, media technology. So we get through the dummy for a minute and we come to one of the headlines. So here we would see, and this is partly how I've kind of directed and shifted and changed some of these actual headlines. Here we would see like a statement from Immendorf, I hate cheap champagne, and this is in the middle of a financial crisis. Of course. Um, but it's spoken, as you see, anonymously, okay? which is not the way a headline would be written. And it's as if he's speaking directly through this newspaper medium, um, direct messaging his fans, if you like. So in, in a similar way that Rolf Pohler, like anonymously spoke and received messages through the Süddeutsche. So they're both examples of breaking the fourth wall, if you like. The blame placement on the other side, we will come to a bit later. Okay. So the next room you step into is a series of three doors um, that are hung in these freestanding adjustable door frames. So you can move through the doors or you can move around the doors. They're kind of interactive and they operate like a regular door in a sense. I'll get into a little bit more detail about that in a moment. But the, the idea in the first place is that you could activate them, you could move through them. And the, the, the room is lit in this other way, actually with work lights from the floor. So the whole room is luminous in this way, not just simply the, the art object itself. And some of the hardware that you saw in the small inflated room reappears here as in, in a reconfigured, another kind of... Um, um, aftermarket assembly reconfigured as a door handle. Um, so between this and the first room with the inflatable space and the desks, there's some relationship that's established between a door and a desk in terms of reconfiguration. And this is reproduced further in uh, through a series of wall drawings here where you will see some of this hardware actually also drawn in this very reduced lawn, uh, line drawing. 
There's also a letter on the wall which indicates correspondence with Amazon. Okay, so here is, is an official, um, stills from an official Amazon film clip detailing the steps necessary to construct one of these tables, which um, in-house um, is described not as a desk, but as a door desk. It's, um, some people will no doubt know this, it's kind of like a founding moment for Amazon, if you like, literally what they call day one um, in physical form. And its invention is necessitated, in a sense, through entirely through cost, um, saving, and what what um, what's called frugality, because it's marginally cheaper to build a desk from a door. Okay, so this is therefore, in a sense, for in-house cost saving. Um, this is, this is really like a 3D business plan. And there are these um, many people that work at um, Amazon, the, their very first day, their very first task on their very first day is to build one of these objects, which are not at all ergonomic. Um, but yeah, it, it also, as I said, it has this other kind of symbolic um, character to it. Here is a line drawing an even more frugal and economic um, description that was used as, as, as another um, wall drawing to indicate the kind of construction. And here's the cover of part of the publication. Where we see this this image again of a of a worker and a desk, um, and it's rendered, if you like, in in an economy of line um, that we all kind of understand and understand kind of um, how this works. But if if we think for a moment in a, a slightly more pragmatic way. The worker here is um, is shown without a chair. In actual fact, um, having to support a two-legged table with the crook of their own body, or if you like, with their crotch. Um, this work th with the doors has been staged several times since 2014. And it requires, um, no, it, it, essential to how it, it functions is something that you may be familiar with. It's called the door problem. It's an industrial design term involving user clarity at a door. So a door is supposed to tell you without words how you operate it. I mean, doors, we understand generally it's, it's very simple. You either pull it or push it. But we know from experience that many door interactions are not frictionless, that we put the wrong force on the door. We pull a door that you have to push, or we push a door we have to pull. Um, and this is a very, very everyday experience that's universal, that everybody has had this experience. Okay. Um, for Kunstwerke, we decided to, um, to test three of these Amazon doors, or aka door desks, in the system, in a sense to give, like, desks a first-time opportunity to be functional doors. Okay, so I think there's a very big difference between a desk and a door, even though, of course, this shift from one to the other, it's not something that, that um, um, Amazon invented. I mean, students, other people have been doing this for years, probably centuries. But 
they they turned it into this this um, business plan, if you like. And um, a desk, of course, is something you can be literally chained to. Yet a door offers some other kind of possibility. So I wanted to give this shift from horizontal to vertical. Um, the piece itself also relies very much on um, this door, which um, uh, and and a mathematician, Jose de, de Jesus Martinez, who um, was a mathematician, worked in the the um, math department at the University of Panama in Panama City. And he knew this problem well because he observed at this door and other doors um, students and other people struggling with this door, not knowing whether you could pull it or push it. I think this door does not just work every single way. Um, it, is, it was um, very confusing when I was there. And this was noted by, um, by the mathematician. And, and what he additionally put into this, this kind of much more regular door problem, if you like, is that this moment of resistance when you give a door the wrong force, a pull rather than a push, that that moment of resistance is a direct communication with the devil. And I thought this was a fascinating, like, anecdote, and I wanted to use it and draw it in, if you like, um, apply it, like, if it could be applied to this door, could it be applied universally? Could it be applied to a door desk from Amazon? So these, these, um, these doors, as you say, were desks turned into doors, now being tested kind of for a proof of the devil or an interaction with the devil. Um, as I said, you can, you can walk through it, open it. This is it closing after someone's walked through it. And the system actually multiplies these moments of resistance or mo interactions with the devil by, in a very sly manner, shifting a door that you would have to pull to a door you would have to push. So one person who comes through it and has to pull it, the next person might have to push it. Okay? And that all goes back to this system here, which, as you say, is a display of six screens, six hard drives. So each computer game represents one potential swing of one of those doors. And two different games, two different worlds, if you like, battle for the swing of the door. Okay? So this is all nothing you could understand in there. But it, is, it has this very strange internal logic that something is really happening here. And it is. Two worlds are battling for the next swing of the door. Okay. Next, we step through to um, a series of, of, of smaller rooms, um, spaces, um, where I've put in some of the old, well, the oldest work in the show, which is from 1987. And some of the most recent, and this, this here, for example, which is 2021. And what I want to do first um, is just give you a sense of moving through these spaces in the first place. So we start here with, with um, th some like thin, stretched, flat material, something plastic, something latex, to an intrusion into the room. Again, stretched with flat plastic material. And an entry into like a cul-de-sac, a dead end. Um, when if you move into it's a completely enclosed space, stretched with this material over the roof as well. So it becomes like a cloud. It gives you this kind of faux museum light, if you like, where they have the light like coming through from above. Or like being in a tent, if you like. And inside, again, it's a very small space. There's only room for one person. And what is displayed here, as you can see, it's, it's like a repository for painting. 
for um, stacked, bound volumes, like a document archive, if you like. And each work is like very meticulously um, dated. Stepping around and behind the space. And then entry in a passageway and down, and you suddenly get a sense of a much bigger space behind, which you didn't have any access to before. Um, and something cut into the wall, and then here, this vitrine, which is literally in the wall. The wall is something like this thick, and this is cut into the wall. And you're actually back here, because if you look at the back wall of this vitrine, that is this giant check here. And this series of spaces and movement caused a lot of what you call um, loss of situational awareness. So people didn't really know where they were. They didn't understand that they were back at this place and that this, the, the check actually formed the back of the vitrine. I mean, you could literally just lift up the corner of the check and you would be in that space. Um, but going on here for a moment, um, like giant checks, of course, checks are not really like a financial instrument people use anymore, and perhaps people aren't so familiar with them. But in this like giant novelty format, giant scale, um, they they are widely used and they continue to be used because they are they're kind of like a, a media tool. They are used for charities and prizes, and um, they communicate in this this kind of way, like so that you can read everything on camera. You can read everything, and the participants who are involved can hold it up. So this piece here is literally called "Hold Up to Live Camera." What I want to talk here for a moment about is you would notice in that check that that um, it references or it's the check is involved in um, raising it's a charity check that's involved in something called a telethon and I don't know if people are familiar with what a telethon is but um, it's it's a 24-hour live television broadcast that's a charity fundraising Marathon, if you like, and telethon, the word itself is a portmanteau of the words television and marathon. So they're a very popular form of fundraising, um, particularly in the like 1980s, 1990s, uh, although they're still, um, can be found, you know, still as a, a, a form today. Um, but why I'm interested in it also is that through this format, you can see the beginnings of some contemporary mediascape that we live in. You can glimpse something of this world that we live in now. So here's a diagram that I've made. And as you can see at the centre, there's a live camera. And around that, um, you'll see here, this would be a studio set up with celebrities, celebrity guests, logos. You would see on this side there's a stage for um, live acts and variety performances. You can see here this is the way that um, people give money. This is like a phone bank so it um, pledges um, are, are received through the phone network and in the top here this is like an illuminated board where you would see the new totals coming up every hour or something. And through and ra around all of this, there is the audience, um, whose role in terms of television has now changed in, in a way because they are participants. It's, it's a kind of, I guess, what you could also call transformative fandom. And in a sense, they become the subject and they direct the action, they direct the camera. Um, 
in an event where every act is monetized. Okay, so here we have an example again. Um, this is like a, a telethon event in New Zealand. It's one of the many locations that were linked up live. And here you see the studio set up with celebrities. Here you see the stage set up for Variety X. And here you see the um, phone bank. But in like coming in through a door here and in the middle of this whole thing, you see um, the audience and you see that the cameras are all turned away from the, the um, studio setup to the audience. Um, so this is like a kind of very, from the time, very um, experimental form of live television. Um, and, and in the case of New Zealand, this is a country where there was for many, many years um, only one channel, which was hugely controlled what you saw on television, who was on television. When the second channel finally arrived, it arrived with a telethon event. That was the beginning of Channel 2. This. So you can see it's like a completely different way of understanding your role as a viewer because you're not a viewer anymore. Yeah? I mean, you're literally the people who give the money and you're, in a sense, literally um, directing the camera. I mean, there is no script for these, these events. Okay, so... I should mention to it, like, because this is all framed up around charity, okay? Um, but the charity itself, in a sense, came to play a very arbitrary role in the midst of this new media format. Um, in a sense, it's instrumentalized by the format and it's edged out as, um, as and, and the format itself becomes the de facto message. And of course, very rapidly, these events became like creepy, vulgar events. I mean, they're, n they're not nice things. They're not nice things to watch, okay? Um, and they instrumentalized um, non-abled people, of course, in, in, in this format where they s suggest that it was okay because they're raising money, okay? Um, the charity of choice that um, is involved in the check that I've shown is the Mental Health Foundation of New Zealand. Okay, so this is um, the, the year was 1979, I think. Um, and this perhaps at the time was thought of as being something bold and progressive. Um, but of course, it was um, at best naive and certainly inappropriate. Um, but beyond any of this, it delved into subjects and conditions that are completely non-televisual. So it's, it's like, well, I, I, I couldn't really understand it. Um, so that's, that's a very quick talk through this, this um, telethon format. What I wanted to do also is talk through these spaces in another way again. Um, and also go back in a moment to um, the arrival in New Zealand of Jörg Immendorf. And one thing that art historically I had never ever been able to understand is how um, art practice progressed from the 1960s, 1970s, through some, a form that would be called structuralist or, or conceptual art practice, how did that turn into painting? Because in the 1980s, painting is very, very prominent. Okay? There is no real, even to this day, even though it's like 50 years or more ago, there's no real explanation as to how that shift actually happened. I mean, there's no real art historical way to understand the progress of 
modernism or the end of modernism or how this, how this really happened. I mean, within the Immendorf story, I propose that it's necessary to understand it in relation to market or the marketplace, which I think is very important to what happened in to, in, in, at that moment. But here also is another example from the time. So what you're looking at, and we're talking about the return of painting, as, as it was called at the time, because I am that old to remember. Um, here we have, um, what you're looking at is, is a very, as a late drawing by the painter Philip Guston, some people may know of him, who was known, and this, this drawing is made in the late 1960s, who was no, known for his gestural abstraction. At some point in the late 1960s, it wasn't just drawings, but with paintings, he pivoted to figuration. Okay, in the late 1960s, and you have to remember that, like, um, that mightn't sound like anything at, by, by, the, at, by this kind of distance now in the 21st century, but this was completely incomprehensible to the axioms of modernism. And my question was also always, how did he do this? And part of my answer that I propose is through architecture. Um, the artist studio complex was in Woodstock, New York. And it's said to have been split across several different, at least two different adjacent spaces. So there was a painting space and there was a lounge room. The lounge room was furnished with a large TV and here you would have a depiction of, of that in, in a drawn form. And the screen was always on broadcasting live the, the turbulence of the times. He painted very often at night, restlessly shifting and shuffling backwards and forwards between like this media-soaked lounge room and a studio which was quarantined, okay, from the rest of the world because it was a high modernist studio, okay. The world can't exist there. This is like singular genius pouring themselves out to a canvas, okay? But it's something that he never really believed in either, you know? But somewhere in the night, somewhere, the, the, um, the presence of this lounge room, this mediated room, um, shifted and left that room and entered, entered the um, studio and um, implanted itself, if you like, into the abstraction that was there. So it's, it's this play, if you like, between two different rooms and the presence of one room moving into the other room. Um, here are some exa examples of the, the smaller paintings that he did in, in, in this return to figuration, which I also used as a model or a double, if you like, for my work, which is also, of course, very Gustinesque from this time. Um, so this is kind of my mine is kind of a double, if you like, of this. And this work, of course, in this space is also um, doubled again with the previous room, with the check in, which is itself dedicated to live TV broadcast through like this mode of telethon. So I was interested in this, tr this, this kind of relationship but, or possible relationships between two different rooms, which you then find again in the last piece in the show. Finally, you're led out of these smaller chambered spaces and you get a bird's eye view into these two enclosures. So again, there are these two spaces, these two um, containers. Um, and you have also this God-like view from the balcony. So it's a move, a shift away from this kind of more Chukis navigation, if you like, because all further um, travel, you can plan from the balcony. 
So this is a single work here from 2017 till the present. Um, in which, like architecture, in a sense, is used a default common container and critical tool. The two enclosures you see here, or rooms, are connected together with um, a walkway or step down into the space, and you can see it. So here, a covered walkway, um, and they form a campus, if you like, a... Um, a mini campus with just two classrooms. So this covered walkway is, um, is a very defining institutional form. You'll see them here on this campus here. We walked through them here. So it's a real, um, speaks very much of institution. So this is the structure in a way that links these two um, enclosures together, which are um, classrooms. And the work is based on two historic academic courses that were both taught in California, but at very, at, at, well, at different times and in very different institutions. They're both taught by short-term adjunct staff, so only for one or a very few number of semesters. And until this project, they have remained unrelated. So here's a view into one of the classrooms and the, the course itself was taught by the evangelical pastor John Wimber, I don't know, perhaps some may have heard of him, who taught a course called MC510, that's the academic course code, how it's identified in this piece, okay, at Fuller Theological Seminary in 1982 to 1984, in the School um, of Church Growth. Okay, and then here we have the other classroom, and this is CS183, the other course code, and that was taught by Peter Thiel. Some of you may have heard of him, and this was taught at Stanford in 2012 in the Computer Science Department. So this, this course was a practical course in faith, healing, and exorcism. This was a course in startup, how to build the future. So stepping into the MC510 room for a minute, I just will give you a very quick view of of the spirit world because that's what is kind of central to this teaching so in a kind of byzantine understanding that you would see if you look at byzantine paintings you would see like beings or faces filling the sky quite often the sky is is not blue sometimes it was golden but sometimes, or very regularly, it also had beings in there, had faces or figures in the, painted in the sky. And this is a description of the spirit world and like a, also a confirmation that, that spirit moves through air. And of course, in a, in a Western sense, the world became more rational, enlightened, modern, less mysterious, more knowable, and this population of the spirit world was cast out and air was like parceled and gridded as airspace, as this industrial medium, um, an infrastructure for transporting people, goods and ideas. So here we have a group of people, this is um, who engage with both of these worlds, both the spirit and aviation technology. This is a group of evangelical, evangelical community here. So spirit believing, dedicating an aircraft. So in their worldview, the medium air can support both aircraft and flight and the spirit world. So all this was like very, um, a prerequisite, if you like, for the 510 course, which dealt 
in detail was something called spiritual warfare, which, of which some of this takes place, of course, in people's bodies, in objects, but through air as well. Um, I kind of saw all this um, as some kind of air traffic control problem. How does all this take place in air? And um, partly because both of these courses were taught by adjunct staff, they really wanted some kind of um, engagement with industry. They came from industry and they wanted to teach um, in that relationship. So there are a lot of kind of industry, industrial products in these classrooms. I mean, these classrooms are not furnished the way anybody who had ever been in or had taught by in these courses or by Teal or Wimba, um, they would not recognize these classrooms. I have like taken um, um, sculptural control of these classrooms, if you like, and put, um, put this industrial materials in there. So here you would see, for example, a, uh, a workshop in the 510 um, classroom, which is something to do with anatomy of the body. And here you would see something that's much more set up like a, a wishing well, if you like, which was a workshop uh, called the rules for taking a city. And here you would see something um, which I believe this was a coursework called Building and Training a Demon Expulsion Team. So out of that classroom, through the um, covered walkway, across the quad, through the second like covered walkway, and into the 183 class. So this is the class taught by Peter Thiel, and you can see it's very furnished in this very different way. It's very clean, ordered, hierarchical. So it's teaching directly from the front of the class, which is very different than the way that the 510 class is laid out, which is like very multi-directional, where like the simultaneous staging of different classroom activities. So this is dark, low, dug out, bunkered. And if you go back here, you would see something that's elevated, raised, floating, illuminated, flying. Oh, too far, sorry. Um, so CS183 presented a series of case studies from a post-2008 worldview. Propos proposing that technological development has stalled somehow, slowed, um, at some undisclosed date again in the 1970s. Um, it's probably best summed up by one of the most famous statements from Thiel, we were promised flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. So you can see there's a sense of disappointment there. Also it highlights that um, like information technology is innovating and developing. Um, but other technologies, for example, aviation, is not changed so much for a long time. One of the other examples that was explored in the class, which is laid out here, is something called the green tech bubble, what Teal called green ghosts. These are all... Um, solar panels made by bankrupt, government-assisted solar startups that are all, have all been sold through a um, um, auction house that specialises in bankrupt startups. So in response to all these problems, because I mean, of course, this is a this is a computer science class, so this is like it's engineering and every um, every problem can somehow be solved and fixed. So in response to this, Teal insists that the only real business structure that is suitable and can work um, for, for successful leadership 
resembles monarchy. Okay, so here we have to like very quickly have a look at, at René Girard, who was um, who's ver very well known um, well philosopher, but taught anthropology at Stanford at the time when Thiel studied there. Um, and developed models for a field called mimetics. Now I'm giving a very, very, like, you know, few word description here, but this is kind of how Thiel describes it in his coursework. And it's all about desire, okay? So why do we desire what we desire? And the answer in terms of, of how this class, class understanding of it is, it's because others desire it, okay? So, um, Girard's models for, for how he developed, developed this um, thinking, a lot of it is drawn directly from biblical stories. He was a conservative Catholic. So, um, we kind of have a bit of a thread here, and I'm following on from it here with several more of these line illustrations that you've seen before. Um, and I should also introduce that the drawings here, for example, the drawing is not a drawing I've made myself and, and some of the earlier ones you've seen are not either and some of them I have adapted. They're actually drawings by uh, an artist, Annie Vallotton, who was the niece of Felix Vallotton and she is best known for illustrating this easy read um, translation of the Bible called the Good News Bible. So here we have Velaton's um, illustrations or drawings, if you like, and Teal's course notes. Okay, so as you can see here, there is there is this idea of the scapegoat. So according to um, Gerard, this um, cycles of desire brings cycles of rivalry which brings cycles of violence that can only be broken by the figure of the scapegoat. And um, that makes the scapegoat not weak, but extremely powerful, god-like figure. A leader who's not, not a god because of their competence, but because of this unique quality of being able to make peace through this sacrificial offer. Um, and here, I guess we have what you'd call a very like troubling business plan, which fits to a, a Chris, Christian worldview. Um, I should add that Teal was raised in an evangelical environment and retains some of this thinking. He contributes to a number of conservative Christian forums. Um, lastly, I also want to have a look at how he understands the future. Okay, because um, that's actually also part of the description of the course, Startup, How to Build the Future. And this also has a troubling um, connection with evangelicism. Because um, in this worldview, um, the future is not just all the things that haven't happened yet. The future has to be different from now. I mean, um, you get a sense of this with the flying cars quote, of course, that, that this idea of this fantastical um, technology would be a huge shift. And then the sense that 140 characters isn't, and it isn't the future. So the future has to be different. It has to be shifted and divided from now, from the present. It has to become in some kind of schism from now, okay? That you would have to step into it somehow in this quite radical way, and that radical way could be very chaotic, could be violent, and it could certainly be undemocratic. So that is actually a very evangelical understanding of time and how time is parceled out in these pieces that aren't even all the same and getting from one to another is and can be incredibly um, well chaotic and violent. Anyway on that note on the end game 
I will leave you back here from the view from Teal's, well, from this desk, which is a representation of Teal's desk, of course, because none of this material is material that would be in the classroom. Behind the chair. And then back out down the covered walkway and some kind of um, more uh, pastoral campus scene. Okay, thank you. Keep the range of questions relatively brief, no? But uh, I wanted to ask, I mean, if I was going to ask a first sacrificial question, um, I was thinking about your, the, the image of the giant check from, uh, I think, 1977. Mm -hmm. um, and the work itself is from 1987. You said it's the oldest work in the show. Which, no, that, the, the, all the telethon material is very new. It's just from last year. Oh, OK. So the, so the giant check is not the oldest work in the show? No, the paintings are. Oh, the paintings are from 87. OK. Yeah. Um, and Sorry. so what took you then back to, because you would have been a child when the telethon happened. What yeah. made you circle back to that particular historical event? And what made you think, OK, in this thing that I might dimly remember, this, this media event, is the seeds of the structure of contemporary social media. Because I take it that, that in a way is the argument, that, uh, um, that this sudden reversal of the TV camera away from scripted performances by celebrities to just what it is, is mm. that's going on mm. in the faces and in the bodies of the, ma of the public, mm. this sort of trans the transformation of the TV into a kind of mirror. Oh, um, it's another example of like breaking the fourth wall. It's, yeah. it's that and it's also user-driven content. It's, uh, yeah, it is. And I mean, it initiates, in a sense, initiates a lot of the more contemporary forms that we see now. Yeah. And to my knowledge, this is totally novel. I don't know anyone else who's argued that, the, that actually if you wanted to drill down to the sort of moment zero of social Well, I don't know if it's moment media. zero exactly, but it is a very interesting format in this way. And I mean, I don't necessarily think that it was... Um, like if, if you saw like telethons that were broadcast in other countries, I don't know if they were quite as chaotic and feral as these ones in New Zealand. But New Zealand had, as I said, this, this, this bottled up thing that there was one channel and there were only a certain number of people that could ever be seen on that. And then suddenly there was this other format. And people learnt this, if you think that people learn you know, these, the, the ways of how to behave on social media in a very rapid way. People learnt this other thing literally in 24 hours. Yeah, that's, I think, what I wanted to come to because you, you, you said that the, uh, um, the sort of the kind of con sociopathic condition of contemporary media where you have this oscillating between different extremes, that it happened almost as soon as the cameras turned on. That as a public streamed in, they started asking weirder and weirder mm. things. We got of the more and more bawdy and more and more. Yeah, there were, I think, huge issues with. Yeah. And so there was a kind of attitude of 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 performative strangeness that arrived instantly with the technology. There was no evolution of human no. nature. That's just a kind of like an. I mean, of again, world. it's it's a very very good example of this, like, which is used in terms of of the um, of this door problem. It's like a, a problem of affordance, like all the things. A designed object can do what well, tells the user without words. I mean, this medium was telling the user without words what to do, how that they could do all these other things, and they did. Yeah, they did. But you want to know how I got, how I came to that? A, a crazy process. I can't really explain it. Some of it's super personal. How I ended up with that, and then. I also didn't want it to be so um, 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 confessional in terms of that. So I had to like bore into, into telethon and figure out what it might be. And then there was, I found that academically there was almost nothing written about this. And then during lockdown, when I was preparing stuff for the show at, at Kunstwerke, I mean, you couldn't go anywhere. But I mean, my studio is full, like archive full of tons of research, tons of material that I've never used. I just pulled out the um, telethon 
archive and thought, well, like, hey, maybe I could, you know? And then I thought, well, maybe I should just try looking up again, see if anything else is written. And then since that time, this other like, fantastic, amazing book was written. And then suddenly there was a way into it. It wasn't written from this evolution of um, um, the mediascape. It was written from, literally from a non-abled person. But it opened up enough to be able to suddenly see a bit more and do something else with it. It was a lot of work. It was, yeah, very different, difficult. And as I say, when I talk about all of this, I mean, some of it is, is from real research, but some of it is literally from experience of watching this as a child. But also, yes, sadly, I have got some VHS tapes and some other... I, I do have rewatched some of the stuff. It's like, sadly, yes, that's true. <laughs> and and I had uh, access to um, a whole lot of pl actual pledge letters. I found an archive, and you could actually read the material, which became the script to direct the camera, because some of the pledges literally ask the camera to do things. So if you open it now to a couple more questions. We capped at two. Maybe three, Max. Perhaps people will be more courageous, you know, talking directly at the bar to the Michael. Perhaps people will be more courageous asking questions directly in a conversation than in front of everyone. Yes. It's, um, so how should we best... Go to the bar. Go to the bar. Go to the bar. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, there's, there is one thing I would add, um, then if this is more than a kind of comment, but uh, it's just for context. Um, in terms of the, because this, we take a, an arc where we move from these rapid, in these jumps from topic to topic, and it can seem uh, that we move from economics to psychology to the media very quickly. But uh, the, uh, the, I, the image of the door as inhabited by the devil, for instance. I know from uh, some of uh, Michael's earlier work, um, it's partly also, it's not just a, a sort of a metaphor, it, it runs through a number of the sources. The mathematician, what was his name? Uh, the, the Panamanian mathematician. Uh, Jose de Llenas Martinez. Jose Martinez. Um, he also was interested in phenomena like that of Maxwell's demon which is a, a topic in entropy you might remember from your engineering and physics classes, which uh, Maxwell proposes as a thought experiment. Imagine a machine in which there is a demon who sits at a door, a molecular-sized demon, and he allows high-energy molecules to go in to a portal, and he keeps the lazy ones out. He's like a kind of St. Peter at the gate of like the door. And he chooses the like, fate of, of each particle. Yeah, it's like a, a, a bouncer. Yeah, or like a bouncer at a nightclub. <laughs> and it's like, this demon would create a perfect engine because it would separate the hot from the cold. It would create energy out of nothing through information. Now, Maxwell is writing this in the 19th century, um, uh, but it becomes a kind of classic thought experiment that then drives some of the crucial inventions of, uh, of modern thermodynamics. Um, yeah, but it comes more than that. It almost becomes a meme because then other people do, there's endless, endless versions of it. I mean, people are still making other versions of it, aren't they? And, it's a, and then in this, in this instance, yeah, it's a, it's a driver because the demon literally operates a door. And, in, and the idea of the demon operating a door is then a seed for an opening of Pandora's box, a creation of technology. So the it doesn't matter if the demon exists or not. Thinking about the demon brings other things into existence, which is also a crucial issue in, in uh, discussions of seance and theosophy. You know, that thinking about certain topics actually changes the texture of reality. So there is in this paranoid weave of topics a capacity to fashion or make things that are as yet unimagined. One of the things that I find as an outsider in artist research, which and it's for me is totally compelling, um, because I'm not allowed to work in this way as a historian, is how much academics always pretend a kind of omniscience. 
that when they write, they pretend they know in advance what the answer is, or they pretend that whatever they did was obviously totally rational, and whatever answer you get at the end of the academic project is clearly the right one and has been somehow deduced. Whereas the reality of a lot of research, especially historical research, is it's like you're blind and fumbling in a basement, trying to find your way out, randomly turning on switches and turning them off and turning left and right. And then at the end, you get to the door and just as you escape, someone comes, a demon, and says, explain why you went that way. And if you can justify it, I'll let you escape. I think that's also a very good description going back into the Lucy Suchman preface because that's very much a description of this um, to keys navigation, that you don't have any view forward, you just deal with what you have directly in front of you. Yeah, because yeah, the two keys navigator, the, he doesn't look from the boat, he's lying in the boat with his eyes closed. Going, they navigate go that by way. the movement of the body. Yeah, so to the bar, to the bar, to the bar. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.